Well, with that, we are in our second week in a sermon series called Living Life on Mission. And life on mission for us as Christ followers is a calling of abandonment. It's the willingness to to take on the mindset of Jesus and to set aside our old lives, to set aside our old preferences, and to follow God, going wherever that God might ask us to go, doing whatever it is that God might ask us to do, even at times, and, and sometimes this is the case, even at times when it doesn't necessarily seem to make sense to us. Sometimes the things that God asks us to do they, they aren't the things that necessarily look like these are the things that should be important to the world. But God's economy, as we've talked about before, is different than the world's economy. What God prioritizes and who God prioritizes is a little bit different. And how God goes about sharing and showing his love to the world is very, very different than the priorities that the world has. And I see this in my own life. Because sometimes this, this means holding on to uh, our own plans, holding on to our own ideas of what should transpire, holding on to those things loosely. And as I said, I, I've seen this repeatedly in my life. I have found that whenever I seem to think I know what is going on in my life and where my life is going, that God comes in like a wrecking ball and redirects my life in some unexpected way. And in the moment, that can both be frightening and frustrating. But if I am faithful, if I see it through, if I trust God to know more about where I need to go and where I need to be doing it, than my own self thinking of what I should be doing and where I should be going. If I trust God, if I am faithful in that, I have found enormous and abundant blessing in that. Um, Everything from, uh, I could just go for hours and hours on how this has affected me. Uh, The biggest one in my life, of course, I had a career before I was a pastor, before I went to seminary even. And God laid on my heart quite severely that I was to go to seminary. And for me, that meant quitting a job I was good at. I had just set the regional high mark in the job in which I was performing. So I was the best in the whole region. And I was in the top five in the nation for the percentage of growth. I had to give up company car, had to give up health insurance, vision, dental, had to give up my retirement, had to give up a very nice salary, had to give up a job that I enjoyed doing with people I enjoyed doing it with. And then, not only that, I had to move six hours from where I lived to the Twin Cities where I knew nobody to go to seminary. That was frightening. That was a leap of faith. And if you know me, well, I can still jump a little bit, but I'm not a big leaper especially when it comes to leaps of faith, right? But I tell you what, God had a plan. Here I am today. God had a plan. It required for me to be faithful, to trust that he knew better than what I knew. And so if we learn to trust God and follow where it is he is trying to lead instead of where we want to go, we will find that in that God can use that to help us become all that he wants us to be. God can in that moment help us become the person he created us to be, to fully become the person he wants us to be. So with that in mind, my first key point for you today um, in our living out our lives on mission is this. For us to live our lives out on mission is the gospel must be foundational. Simply put, the gospel is the announcement of the good news that transforms our lives. It is the the starting point. It is the sustaining point. It is the finishing point of living life on mission. And an everyday missionary who is not grounded in the gospel is is really not a, a missionary at all because if you are not grounded in the gospel, you you have no good news, therefore, to proclaim. Gospel, the word gospel itself literally means good news. And as Christ followers, we are called to share that good news, to be a herald, to proclaim, to go into the world and tell everyone, to go tell it on the mountain, as we sang back at Christmas, right? 
we have the good news. Being an everyday missionary is impossible then without that gospel foundation. Because you see, the gospel is kind of like a bungee cord, right? A bungee cord for somebody who's about to jump off the bridge, okay? I don't know, anybody in here ever bungeed? I've not bungeed. I, I am a big guy and I'm afraid of how strong they might be. I understand gravity. I mean, I know they do the math, but I don't know. I have a cousin who bungee jumped a number of years ago, and, and she literally, um, she, she's my nearest in age cousin, lives in Colorado, and she went and bungee jumped and, and immediately sent me a picture of it, uh, of, of her standing on the ground looking back up and a bunch of information and how it was the greatest thing ever and how I, how I haven't lived until I've done that, so I guess I haven't lived, and that's okay. I, I will continue to live not living. I prefer that. <laughs> right? But the gospel is kind of like a bungee cord that keeps that jumper connected to life, right? Just as a, a bungee jumper can't jump off the platform without being securely fastened to that bungee cord, a, a follower of Christ cannot spring into missions without a secure gospel foundation. Without that, that, that cord, our missions efforts will be in vain. The gospel is not something that we just simply get. It is something that we grow deeper in. It's something that we, we, throughout our lives, are genuinely growing in. The gospel isn't something we just receive once. The gospel is something for us to be invested in and involved in and continually growing and sharing. That is what the gospel is to be to us. And if the gospel isn't genuinely the foundation and the motivation of our mission then the truth of the matter is we're going to falter. We're going to fail. We're, we're not going to share our faith with others. And likely, we may even fall astray. Everyday missionaries with a solid gospel foundation understand that, that missions isn't just kind of this periodic thing, right? Missions isn't just a, a single service project. Yes, we are going to serve the teachers, and that is a, a missions event, right, next Friday. But every day between now and Friday, God will give us missions opportunities if we will just look for them, if we will seek them, if we will just respond to them. Being an everyday missionary is an intentional sort of thing. It's living out intentionally as a missionary wherever we go, whoever we come into contact with. It requires us to live selflessly. One of the big challenges in our society, in the Western world, is our rugged individualism, right? Where we... We think we can do it all ourselves, right? Where I got this. I don't need you. I don't need you. I can take care of this, right? Whatever this might be. We don't like to admit to one another our weaknesses. We don't, we don't like to have to call and ask for help. And as we develop that ethos, that also means then, well, we don't like to share our faith a lot of times as well. We... We, we get a little hesitant. We begin to think, well, what's the other person going to think about me? Right? You don't want to make your relationship weird, do you? Right? So, so we get a little bit afraid. We get a little bit worried. We begin to think about, well, what's this other person going to think about me? And yes, it can get awkward. It can be a little bit weird if you, if you don't know how to live, love, and serve others first. If the very first point of contact with the gospel with another person is you opening up a Bible and saying, hi friend, can we talk about Jesus? It will be a little bit awkward. But if you've been loving, if you've been serving, if you've been investing in their life, if you've been trying to shepherd them along, if you've been showing them Jesus' hands and feet in your day-to-day -day life, then when God opens that door for you to talk about Jesus, it's not awkward. If you've been loving the person who sits in the cubicle next to you at work, if you've been loving the student who's on your team with you, if you've been loving your next door neighbor and serving them, 
than when their spouse has a health problem. All of a sudden, they're willing to listen. Then when their 401k crashes because the stock market crashes, they're willing to listen. Then when their life isn't going as they expected it to go, when their kids are misbehaving, when there's addiction, when there is problems, because you've been there along the way, their hearts are ready for the gospel. They're ready then to hear about the one who has made the difference in your lives. So every day it's intentional living. Each and every day it's living out the gospel truth, understanding that Jesus is already the great reward and serves as our motivation for this. Here's our key verse for today. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul writes these great words. He says, writing back to the Corinthian church, and, and just as a bit of background before I read this to you. If you don't remember the story of the Corinthians, the Corinthians were Paul's knuckleheads, right? The book of First Corinthians is basically Paul saying, hey, knuckleheads, I taught you the right things, and now you're doing the wrong things. Slap, 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 knock it off. That's a summary of First Corinthians. So with that in mind, these are Paul's words to the church at Corinth. He says, guys in Corinth, ladies in Corinth, families in Corinth, kids in Corinth, he says, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it. If you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no purpose. For I passed on to you as the most important what I also received. Here's the key. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You see, even for the apostle Paul, this was foundational. Time and time and time again in his ministry and in his life, he returns to this. And, and that's not by accident. That's not by mistake. The gospel nourishes us in our faith and it empowers us and it demands of us that we go and share that good news with others. Imagine if you woke up this morning and somehow, all of a sudden, you had the cure for cancer. Wow, wouldn't that be awesome? Would you be telling people? Okay, folks, cancer will knock a couple years off your life, maybe a couple decades even, but it's going to knock some time off your life, right? But what about the gospel? Are the stakes higher with cancer or with eternity? And I know you woke up this morning knowing about Jesus, or at least most of us probably did. If we had the good news about cancer, we'd be telling everybody. We would have gone on Facebook, we would have gone on Twitter, Instagram, we would have been calling everybody on our phone. Hey, I figured out the solution to cancer. Get in on this. Right? Cancer's over. Cancer's done. Cancer's gone. Kicking it to the curb. We win. Woohoo! But too often we sit over here and go, I've got Jesus all to myself. Right? We have the good news. We live in a world that is hurting, a world that is broken. We know this. We see this. We live this. We feel the impact of the broken world, don't we? What is the solution to the broken world? What is greater than all of the problems in this world? There is only one thing. There is only one name, and that name is Jesus. See, we have the good news. We just have to decide, are we willing to share it? Are we willing to step out in faith? Are we willing to take that risk? Are we willing to lean into that little bit of discomfort that we occasionally might feel? Are we willing to take that risk? If it was cancer, we'd take the risk. Will we do the same for that which we believe? The stakes are high. The stakes are eternal. Telling others about Jesus matters. Loving them, 
serving them, investing in them, inviting them in the name of Jesus is the most important thing you can do in all of your relationships. And not only is the the gospel critically and absolutely foundational to this, but the thing that comes along with that then is that spiritual maturity is essential for this to happen. See, as a pastor, one of the things that I see is our world doesn't need people who, need, who, who know more facts about God. But rather, our world needs people who are falling more deeply in love with God. Never in history have we had so many rich resources for our theology, right? I can pull up more information about the Bible, about Jesus, about God, about the Holy Spirit, about places in Israel, and all kinds of other trivial facts about the Bible. I can pull out my phone today and have more knowledge than the history of the world combined has ever had. We have all the resources. We have all of that. The issue is not, do we have enough? Do we have access to it? No, we do. Even if you don't own a computer, you can go to the library. Right? If you don't own a smartphone, you can still go to the public library, get free internet access, and look everything up you could ever want to know about everything in the Bible. The world doesn't need more people with nuggets of knowledge. The world needs people who love Jesus more. The world needs people willing to live out that good news. That is where the difference is going to be made. Yes, it's okay. It's good. It's a great thing, in fact, to learn more about the Bible, to learn more about the gospel, to learn more about Jesus, to study those things. That's a great thing. But far too often, we, we kind of pull up a chair to that spiritual buffet, and we sit there and gorge ourselves, and then we never go out and live it out. Each and every one of us is called to be a missionary where God has planted us, where we live. Every single person in this room is put into a unique position with unique people in your lives that only you have the opportunity to reach. I can't reach them. Your spouse can't probably reach them. Somebody from another church probably can't reach them. You have a unique relationship with a number of people in your life where you are the opportunity for them to see Jesus. The scripture prompts this quite clearly. And if we, if we don't take this seriously, the, the Bible has some words about that as well. The Bible warns that if we, we don't take this action step, if we just sit back and kind of soak it in, but don't get in the game, the Bible kind of calls us like, we're an older child or maybe an adult who's still drinking out of the formula bottle, right? A little bit weird, wouldn't it be? You invite your, your friends and family over for Christmas dinner, right? Big spread, you got the turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy. You go over to your microwave, stir something up, heat it up, pour it into one giant adult-sized sucky bottle. <laughs> and you sit down at the table and start eating, right? It'd be a little bit weird. Now, if your turkey was good, I might not say anything, but that'd be a little weird. But scripture says in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, the writer says, we have a great deal to say about this, that it's difficult to explain since you've become too lazy to understand. Although by this time, you ought to be teachers. So, so the writer is saying, you should have grown to the point, to this audience. You should have grown to the point that you should be a teacher, yet you need someone still to teach you the basic principles on, of God's revelation again. The writer says that these folks needed milk and not solid food. And it goes on to say, now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. We want to get to that place where we are the solid food eaters. 
We want to move spiritually in maturity and in our growth where we then can be the teachers, we then can be the servants, we then can be the ones to disciple and help create the next generation of followers. Followers of Jesus don't happen randomly. Followers of Jesus don't happen by accident. We have to cultivate them. We have to be active and part of that. And one truth from Hebrews 5 is that although there should be a a correlation between the amount of time that somebody's known Jesus and their spiritual maturity, the truth of the matter is it doesn't always work that way, right? There are are many believers who who spiritually, their maturity lags behind what their spiritual age is. And the only person who can fix that is you. I can't fix it. Your, your, Your Sunday school teacher can't fix it. Your Bible study leader can't fix it. Your vacation school Bible study leader can't fix it. The FCA can't fix it. Your basketball or football coach can't fix it. The only one who can help you mature spiritually is you. And it takes time, investment, and dedication for that. You have to choose it for yourself. And to become spiritually mature, it starts with our understanding just those simple, basic tenets of our faith. Things like the supremacy of God. That, that God is king and able to do exactly what he says he's going to do. And that God is at the very center of, of our mission and, and of all of our lives. And if we believe that, that God is supreme, then we are finally then in a good position to begin to mature spiritually. Because then our our desires, then our decisions will become submissive to him. And then through that, God can realign our priorities, realign our hearts towards his kingdom goals for us. Another one of those key tenets, another one of those basic items is the sovereignty of God. That God is active and involved in every aspect of his creation, including our lives. Everything from providing food for us to knowing the number of the days that we will live. And and not only that, all of the talents that we have, everything that he has given us is from him. You see, everyday missionaries must understand that God is at work in the world and we are asked to respond and then partner in with him and live in obedience to where he is calling us. It's not up to us to determine the focus of that mission. It's simply up to us to follow God. As I said, some days that's easier and some days that's harder. Some days it's easy to see the path and plan that God has laid out for your life and to follow it and be faithful. Other days, boy, that can be tough. When we have to live in a way that's countercultural when we have to stand up for what we believe, when we have to step out of our comfort zone a little bit, it can get uncomfortable. But as long as we follow in obedience, we will be living in the center of God's will. And if living in the center of God's will is your focus, I assure you, amazing things will happen. You will see transformation in yourself and in those around you if we are faithful. Now the Bible warns us if we live this way, if we are faithful, if we are living out our faith, there's going to be some bumps in the road. There is going to be resistance. There will still be difficult times. God never promises us an easy road. In fact, God promises us very much the opposite of that. Trials, tribulations. But if we remain faithful, our reward will be far greater in heaven than anything we could imagine. See, the stakes in which we play as a church and as people of Christ are far greater than anything else. Yes, it's important that my son learns how to read and I want him to be good at math and I want him to have a good job and a good wife and great grandkids for me to have and spoil and rotten and all that kind of good stuff. But more so than any of that, I want my son to know and love Jesus. 
That's my first priority. And if he gets that, well, we'll work on the rest of that. And so we as followers of Christ have to get those fundamentals right. Our living out our everyday mission, it can be messy, but that's okay. God is in the middle of the mess and God is faithful to deliver his promises. As I was thinking about this, kind of the third key idea that we need to repeatedly return to is the love of God. See, the love of God is one of the key things that differentiates Christianity from all of the other world's religions. If you grew up Buddhist, you don't know the love of God. If you grew up Hindu, you don't know the love of God. If you grew up a follower of Muhammad in Islam, you don't know the love of God. Islam in particular, God is nearly unknowable And you never know exactly if he's happy with you. You never know exactly, did I do enough, God, that I might go to heaven? Hmm. That's not a particularly loving relationship. You come to Christianity, however. How did God love you? Well, he created you. He's blessed you. He sent his son to die for you, raise again, so that you could be reconciled, that despite your personal brokenness, that despite your personal sinfulness, that you could be in a relationship. God loves you, folks. And when we return to that love of God, and when we share that love of God, it's what differentiates us from everything else. God, in a mysterious act of grace, reached down and loved you. Not because he had to, but because he chose to. And the world needs to hear that good news. The world needs to hear that God isn't out to get them, right? That God isn't that guy sitting on their shoulder looking over, waiting for them to screw up so that he can punish them, right? But yet a lot of the world kind of has that mentality. I had that mentality before I came to faith. I always thought God was waiting to get me, waiting for me to screw up. So I thought, well, if I'm just good enough, if I'm, if I'm better than Kevin, then maybe I'll get to go to heaven, right? Or if I'm, better than Connie or better than Kim or better than Lyle. That's all I got to do, right? I just got to be better than them. Isn't God going to grade on a bell curve? I mean, if, I, if, I, if I'm in that top 50%, I mean, I might be a C Christian, maybe a B minus, but won't it get me there? I, mean, I didn't do as many, I, I'm not like, I didn't kill anybody, right? Well, what did Jesus say? You look at your brother with anger and hatred in your heart, you call him Raka, stupid. You've basically killed him in your heart. It's not about what we actually do, it's about where our hearts are, folks. God wants to transform our hearts so that we might share his love. Because see, the gospel doesn't just free us, I mean, that's awesome. But the gospel doesn't just free us, it changes us. The gospel fundamentally changes us so that we might love in ways that we've never loved before. That we might love as we were first loved. Galatians 5, 22 through 25, a passage you're familiar with, I'm sure. It says, the fruit of the spirit is love, right? Right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faith, gentleness, self-control, against which there are no such laws. When we are in Christ, these fruits of the Spirit can flourish and develop and we can share them and make a difference in the world. 
If we are not applying what we learn, if we are not living out what we learn, then all of the time we spend studying the Bible, all of the time you spend listening to me, any time that you spend reading a book about the Bible, any time you spend listening to a sermon on tape or Christianity on the radio or watching it on TV, if we don't live that out, all of that time is wasted, folks. How many of you want to waste your time? Most of us don't. And so fundamentally, the key is to live out God's love. And I'll close again with this reminder to you today that God has put you in a place uniquely to love the people in your life. Nobody else can do that for you. Now, we do have to be in community. We aren't Lone Ranger Christians. We come together once a week and join together here so that we might strengthen and encourage one another and that is a good and right and holy and biblical kind of thing. We are all in this together. And if I can come alongside of you, if I can help you, if I can equip you, or if somebody else in our church can help you and equip you so that you might better reach your neighbor, reach your family, reach your friend, even reach your enemies, then that's what we're here for. Just let us know how we can help. Let us know where we can help. Let us know when we can help. Because help, we want to be. Everyday missionaries need one another to carry out the work that's been placed before us. God never intended for us to go it alone. So as you go this week, I want to remind you first that every day this week I've prayed for that list you gave me last week. Some of you texted me some names. Some of you wrote down on a piece of paper some names. Some of you even wrote the same name. So that person really is spiritually kind of getting tag teamed and hopefully something great's going to happen there but I have those names sitting on my desk right now and I'm going to continue praying for them I'm going to continue praying for you as well I'm going to pray that God puts you in a position this week to make a difference in their lives I'm going to pray that this week you get a chance to love on them to serve them to maybe invest in them and and possibly even invite them. If you look around the room here, every one of these chairs is an opportunity. We have plenty of space. And it's not just about getting people to come to church because that's not what it's about. It's about getting people to come to Jesus. But they are welcome here. And my challenge to you this week is Find a way to step out in faith. Find a way to step out of your comfort zone. To love, serve, invest, and then invite. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for the people whose names you've given me. I will pray for all of you by name. That God will begin to work something amazing. Now know this. You may not see the results. This is one of the frustrating things about sharing our faith. We are called to go to the field and plant seeds. We are called to go to the field sometimes to water those seeds. But how many of you can actually make the seed grow? Right? When the farmer plants that seed in the ground, he plants with faith. We too must do the same. So as you go this week, go love, serve, invest, and invite. And let God take care of the rest. Amen.